Hello, everyone. Welcome to University Hospital's Department of Medicine Grand Round Series. Today, we are pleased to have Dr. Deborah Leisman speak with us about her experience in medical student teaching. Dr. Leisman is a product of the University of Cincinnati for Medical School and Residency at Temple. After serving on staff at Temple as an assistant professor, she moved to Northwestern University before finally settling at Case Western Reserve University. For the last 22 years, Dr. Leisman has been a mainstay of our program, leaving her imprint on not only the residents, but also on the medical students. She has helped to shape the third and fourth year medical student clerkships, including instituting overnight hospital experiences which are fondly received. Dr. Leisman also is known to us house staff for her relentless compassion and kindness. She is truly an example of the humanity in medicine. We are very lucky to have her amongst us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Leisman to UH Grand Rounds. Thanks, Ben. That's right. <laughs> there we go. So, um, well, welcome to everybody, and thanks for being here. I'm going to be talking about the internal medicine clerkship and um, some updates that I want to give. Before I start talking about that, I want to um, recognize and acknowledge some of my co-clerkship directors at the VA. It's Dr. Packer. My associate clerkship director here at UH is Dr. Aaron Kistemaker. And my clerkship coordinator extraordinaire is Cindy Nezapur. At the VA, Dr. Rhonda Murad is the associate clerkship director. And Nicole Turk is the uh, new clerkship coordinator. My goals during this uh, talk, I actually have five goals of what I want to achieve. We'll see how I do. I was speed talking last night, so we'll see how I get through them. Um, one, I'd like to explain the current structure of the third year internal medicine clerkship at Case, and in particular at UH and the VA. Second, I want to talk about the feedback we get at the end of clerkship annual questionnaire, the data for UH VA internal medicine clerkship. Then I want to talk about how you can retrieve your own faculty evaluations in CAS. And then last, uh, fourth, I'm going to talk about the student notes and our new student EMR attestation that's coming our way. And lastly, I want to try to use a sample electronic medical student note, a real note, to advise about feedback techniques and review some assessments. We'll see if we get to all of that. Just a little history and pictures, okay? That in the top right is Case Medical College in 1846 on 9th and Euclid. Bottom right is where we are today. And then over here is the Health Education Campus, where um, which the students at the school will be moving to in May, which is going to be absolutely amazing and present some challenges that we're going to have to work through as well. Um, the top picture is some of our star students, but just had to put them in there as well because they're so critical. Okay, first uh, topic is the Core 1 clerkship structure across the city. First of all, there are four clinical training institutions that the School of Medicine uses for their core clerkships, UHVA, Metro, and Cleveland Clinic. So, I want to, if you all will um, text uh, clerkship 038 to the number 22333. Whoops, how do I reset, Cindy? I need a little help here. I want to see how many of you have, to, how long you spent on your third year internal medicine clerkship. When I was in medical school, and Dr. Armitage likes to refer to that time as when the dinosaurs roamed, when I was in medical school, I had 12 weeks, eight weeks of inpatient and four weeks of outpatient. Okay, here they come. Just let it go now. Okay. Dr. Uh, Salada, how long were you on medicine clerkship for? Twelve. I can show you. We can count so you can see how many people. It's okay. That's fine. You find this one. Yeah, this is good. All right. So you get a sense of kind of what it was and that it's been shortening. And actually, um, we just did the clerkship direction in internal medicine. We just did a structure paper that was just accepted for presentation, and eight weeks is actually the average right now. That's coming out. But here at UHVA, here's our structure, okay? We do six weeks of inpatient internal medicine, one week of outpatient internal medicine, one week of night float, and three weeks of family medicine. Plus, running through it, we have didactics and IQ+. Plus. Um, our students are integrated into medical teams. I'm a general internist. I think that strongest teams are our general medicine teams for a breadth of education and exposure to our medical students. But we only have two general medicine teams. So the students switch after three weeks. At the VA, they only stay on one team. 
We expect the students to work up eight to 10 new patients, meaning that they do a history and physical, they follow that patient, they write their notes. We have assigned a separate teaching attending. In addition to the ward attendings, there is a separate teaching attending because we recognize that when the students are on the floor and they're presenting at morning work rounds, they only have about two to three minutes to present a patient. So we want to make sure that teach, that student has really mastered the oral presentation, writing an HMP, clinical reasoning skills. So we have separate teaching attendings. Our teaching attendings happen to be Dr. George Naff and the chief residents. Down at the VA, Dr. Murad does this with the medical students, but it's extraordinary. Our, our students are really, really well trained. We also have night float. As Ben mentioned, night float was something we set up uh, right after the duty hour changes, the last set of duty hour changes, where we happened to notice that about that a lot of patients were being admitted overnight. And actually studies have shown when you have night float, about 40% of your admissions happen in the evening because you want to use that staff that you have on in the evening. And our students were not working up patients who were undiagnosed or undifferentiated. They were getting handed patients who had already been admitted the night before. So we set up night float. And there were a lot of advantages that we didn't even recognize by setting this up. One was the students are with the team the whole time. During the week, we pull the students out for teaching attending. The students go back to the medical school on Fridays. We estimate there's 10 to 15 hours that they're pulled out from the six weeks of inpatient medicine time. On night float, they're there the whole time. Um, the students also have to take a shelf exam. At the end of 12 weeks, they take a family medicine shelf exam, and they take an internal medicine shelf exam. We're always balancing the clinical experience with having the students achieve a certain basic amount of medical knowledge at the end of the clerkship. Okay. Um, just to kind of reiterate that, and Sir William Osler says that better than I do, to study the phenomenon of disease without books is to sail an uncharted sea, or to study books without patients is not to go to sea at all. Um, this is Metro's clerkship structure, pretty similar to ours you'll look at. Six weeks of inpatient, four weeks of family medicine and outpatient, one week of palliative medicine, one week of PM&R, and notice they have this thread of a half a day per week in outpatient in their family medicine clinic that's considered their longitudinal exposure. So they're doing that for a half a week with the idea that you really want somebody to know that student really well because you know sometimes you can be on a service for just one week interacting with a student and that student, that's how long you know them for. And this is the clinics model. The clinics model is similar for our residents, we'll know, to our COE program down at the VA a little bit because they have a three month ambulatory block and then they have a nine month inpatient block. So they have three months of outpatient where they just have 12 weeks so they may see their internal medicine doctor clinic every Wednesday afternoon for 12 weeks, so go to that same clinic. And maybe their peds clinic is in the morning on Wednesdays. So this is a different model because the structure is different than the other two. The clinic um, decided it wasn't feasible to have students go to all different institutions for the third year. And they have, um, they have 80 students just come to the clinic for all of their third year core clerkships. Um, most of you know, but the med school has about 220 students and they have one track that they call the learner clinic, clinic students and the other about 180 students are through the university track. They want all of their clinic learner students stay at the clinic for their third year clerkships and then there's room for another 48 students. Okay. So that's the structure of the internal medicine clerkship. How are we doing as teachers? Okay. At the end of each quarter, because we have four quarters, we actually have the students do evaluations. They can't even get their grades unless they complete these evaluations. And we ask um, a lot of different questions. One of the questions is, have we provided effective teaching? Okay. And uh, this is the 2017-18 Clerkship Annual Report. On a scale of one to five, we actually provide excellent, excellent teaching. And I will tell you, internal medicine across the board does a great job and actually even across the nation does a great job. We take it upon ourselves that we are kind of the last bastion before that student gets out. We have to make sure they have to know how to take a history, a physical. We do direct observation. It is really important that we see them, and we do really well. You can see UH 
what these numbers are. I will tell you also, we came out just this past weekend, they came out with the first six months. The UH residents scored a perfect five in teaching for the last six months. Amazing, so really impressive. I also need to talk, want to talk to you about mistreatment and neglect. I kind of hate those terms, they're not my terms. AMC, LCME, they kind of sound pejorative and uh, judgmental, but we're really just trying to make a really safe learning environment. And um, this is a term that's used to try to capture when the students are, particularly in the clinical years, if they're not being treated appropriately and not in an environment where that is appropriate. So um, this is Dr. Pat Thomas, the Vice Dean of Education. I think I saw her walk in. Um, but she provided these slides to me. And uh, this is what mistreatment is, as you probably sense. It takes the form of physical punishment, sexual harassment, psychological cruelty, and discrimination. And it's when it interferes with the learning process, as I said. And this is neglect. Basically, when you're ignoring the student, they don't feel like they're included in what's going on. Um, these are the slides from the same questionnaire from July to June 2017-18. What you're seeing here are all the disciplines plus emergency medicine, because that used to be a shared clerkship, still is a shared clerkship with surgery. And what the data shows for uh, mistreatment, and uh, the next page I'm gonna show you, um, I will show you a neglect. So here you see is internal medicine, one witness mistreatment, one personal, and this is all sites combined, okay? I wanna point out neglect here. So 10 for neglect, so that's more common and consistently more common than mistreatment. Okay. So I drilled down and I looked at those specifically to see what we were doing to see what was happening with those. Neglect was um, reported by five students, three at UH and two at the VA, and um, four of those five reports happened in the first quarter. And I take that upon myself and the med school because I think, ha, huh, that means I don't think, and when you read the comments it, it, it pans out, I do not think that we were preparing the students as well to transition from the classroom to the hospital, where they have to be, they're not as much passive learners, but active learners. And I'm happy to say that this first quarter, we had no reports of neglect, so I'm pleased to say that. The one other VA student felt that his neglect happened in ambulatory and night flow, which is a little more challenging, so. Mistreatment, as reported by the student at the UH and the VA also, was a little surprising to me when I looked at that. Um, the UH student, complaint was about um, didactic. He, the teacher was using the Socratic method and that student was upset about being taught that way. And the VA student who was complaining about mistreatment was complaining about mistreatment from another medical student. So you just have to all take it into perspective, but, um, but it's important we have to create a safe learning environment no matter what. Okay. So those are the overall end of clerkship evaluations. You all also get faculty evaluations in the computer assessment system, which we, um, the, we use the acronym CAST for those of you who haven't used it. So how many of you have checked your own faculty evaluations? It's okay, but, oh, did it go? It's okay, you don't have to lock it, you got it clear? <laughs> right, huh? Okay. I was guessing nobody had checked it. This is pretty good. Okay. All right. Let me just show you how to do it. So this is how you get into the um, CAS system, if you, and you can all get into it. Well, this is on the website, but HTTP has just to remind you how to get into the CAS system. Once you get into the CAS system, this is the toolbar on the top. You click on the one with the little head and the graph behind it, okay? And this is your individual faculty view. This is the top half, the bottom half is the student part. So here, this person, this faculty member got fives in the yellow, okay? And what you see is it shows you how you compare it to the, your disciplines. Oh, by the way, these slides are courtesy of Dr. Neil Mehta, who created the CAS system. He, he, he lent these to me. Um, you compare yourself to other people in internal medicine and at your site, so here at UH. And here you can compare yourself to other internal medicine faculty at all sites, okay? And then you, that's the average rating, okay? And then you can come down here, these are the individual comments and actually how you're rated. So this is a whole student, they're commenting upon your communication, your feedback, your supervision skills, your professionalism, and then some overall comments. 
The left column is positive, the right column is negative. What I want to show you here, I know I'm not supposed to walk away from the uh, microphone, but this student, okay, he rates people from like a two to a five, so the green is a five. This is another faculty member that's five. That student up there, he gives all fours and fives. So this is definitely the more discriminating evaluation when you're looking at it. Okay? You have to get three evaluations in order to get a cast grid like this and to be able to see them because we feel if it's less than that, you know the student who's evaluating you and it's less anonymous, okay? But you should look at your evaluation. We want you all to be the best teachers possible. Okay, now I'm switching to medical notes. I think this is my favorite topic here. And medical student attestation in the, in the electronic medical record. So you know all know the value of a medical note. It tells you what's happening with the patient. It tells you how the student's thinking. You can give feedback to the student. It is so important that it's considered one of the core entrustable professional activities. That's the new jargon we're using to talk about what medical students have to accomplish before they can go to residency, okay? Number five is document a clinical encounter in the patient record. We have 13 of them that you're supposed to get through before you get to the end of medical school. Um, they're pretty general, okay? So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the history of the medical student note, okay? I'm not going to go back to Hippocrates of 5th century BC, which is what I found is the first note, but I'm going to go back to 1998, okay, here? I'm going to go back to 1998, because in 1998, okay, the Office of Inspector General, our tax money, okay, at that time, it's, a lot of you weren't alive, but those of us who were, our tax money went to evaluating the past physicians, physicians at teaching hospitals, okay? They did an audit of past physicians. At that time, what they found was that a lot of these documents didn't show that the attending had seen the physician. And they said, you are doing false data. You can't charge for this because we don't know that the attending saw the, the patients at all. So they, made, they levied very large fines on some major academic institutions. And from that behavior, in 2002, CMS changed the billing rules. And they said, and those of us who are old enough remember this, they said, now all the teaching faculty have to see the patient, have to write their own note, and now have to sign at least the residence note. And have to, you can't just write agree with above. You have to show that you saw that patient. And they changed the laws for medical students too. At that point, they said medical student documentation can only be billed, you can only bill for review of systems, social history, and family history. Even if you're in the room and you do the exam with the student, you can't build for that. You have to rewrite every single part of that exam, which was really unfortunate in a way because back in the dinosaur day, when we had paper charts, I would write a note, the resident would come along and correct my note, and the attending would come along and maybe sign below. But we had one note where we were all participating on that single note. And you felt like you were really helping your intern. You were writing the note. You were really taking care of the patient. And the students kind of got out of that flow because their notes weren't being used. The good news is, 2008, we had revisions, yay. And so we have revisions to CMS, and I'm gonna go through that in a little bit. Um, this is the path audits that happened in 1998. You can see Penn was um, charged $30 million, Jefferson was charged $12 million, Dartmouth and Yale were not charged. They didn't have any uh, um, uh, penalties, but Virginia got charged $8.6 million, and Pittsburgh was $17 million, University of Pittsburgh. And this was $1998. So just so you know the history of why this happened. Um, in 2016, as we were starting to complain about the fact that student notes weren't counting and that it was a suboptimal learning situation, uh, we decided as part of the clerkship um, and internal medicine group to send out a survey. And I actually wrote the survey, and I'm going to go over some of our results because they're interesting and they're pertinent, I think, to just think about. Um, one of the things we found out on the survey, and we surveyed 126 accredited medical institutions, we had 95 of the clerkship directors answered back. Um, 20 different computer platforms at institutions across the country, 20 different computer platforms. Epic is used in 36% in 2016. CPRS is in the brown, was the second most common at 19.5%. All scripts is in the mustard green over there, or mustard yellow. But that's a lot of platforms. And it's particularly a lot of platforms if you think about the fact that our students go to lots of different places for their inpatient training. More than 50% of students go to over four sites. I'll tell you, for us, for our university students who do it here at university, 
They have to sign up for Allscript and be trained and certified in Allscript. That's an hour online and four hours in the computer lab on Cornell. Then they may do a week at night float at the VA, so they also have to train in CPRS. And then if they do their outpatient, our outpatient AMR is different than our inpatient, so they have another hour of training. That's a lot of time that's not being used to learn about actually medical facts and you, um, you world for my students who are in the back, but are done, you know, being used for um, computer training. I guess we can't get one unified medical record yet, but that's, that's, that's down the road. Um, another problem that we recognized was, as I already talked about, that the students weren't getting feedback. And this panned out that only about half of the students were getting written feedback on their notes. And what was the biggest barrier to give, giving feedback? Was it that the notes were not put in a timely way? The notes were hard to edit in the computer? The notes weren't part of the workflow? The notes were hard to find? Because one thing I didn't show you is some people um, hid the notes, some of the note, medical notes, student notes disappeared when the, the patient was discharged. Some people still have paper notes for the students and they weren't allowed to put anything in the computer or competing clinical demands. And this shows that the big barriers to providing feedback were the competing clinical demands and the fact that the note was not part of the workflow. We have too much else to do if we have to re-document things. So fast forward to 2018, March 2018, and CMS changed their laws. They are now going to allow teaching physicians to verify a student's assessment of a patient, but does not require them to re-document the entire encounter, okay? What's really important, you still need to see the patient as the attendings or the residents. You still need to see the patient. You still need to be the one who's making the medical decisions, but you do not need to re-document that, okay? That's really, really critical. Um, again, I emphasize the teaching physician must either be with the student when they personally perform, so you can be with them, or you have to re-perform the physical exam. And the teaching physician is responsible for medical decision making, but does not need to re-document the student notes. This is the uh, Medical Learning Matters from CMS, and they're talking about evaluation management services. So this is the form that came out, and they actually even updated it again in May 31st. And again, I just reiterate, because it's really important to know, the teaching physician must still personally perform or re-perform the physical exam and medical decision-making activities in order to bill, but you have to verify. You don't have to re-document. You just have to verify that you were there and, and what they said. Okay, so that's a big, big deal. Um, so I went to, um, I've been rallying, actually, believe it or not, for this to come about here at University Hospital for a long time. In December, I went before the committee for the IT committee, and it was formally approved. Easier said than done, you think it's just going to switch over. Um, what I learned was that there are 21 templates for history and physical notes. There are uh, 13 templates for progress notes. There are seven different templates for procedure notes, and there are two different templates for emergency medicine notes. So they're working on it. I was told they would start first with a progress note, and it should be up and running by March 6th, I was told. Um, this is what the students are going to have to do, okay, students? You pay attention. Do you require another individual to attest to your documentation? You say yes, okay? I am a medical student. Oh, I just want to point out, this CMS um, law does not apply to nurse practitioners or AP, advanced practitioners. It applies to medical students. It was not created for the ancillary practitioners. It was created for medical students, okay? Um, and then you say who you're going to send it to. You have the option to send it to your resident, or you have the option to send it to the attendant. You can just put your comments here, so you know, however you want to verify, you can put them right in here, or in the body of the note, you all know that there's that little modify thing up in the upper left, you can modify the student's note by just going there, okay? And this is a note that's sent to the attending for attestation. It's a little different because remember, the resident still has to send their notes to the attending for attestation. So do you require another individual to attest to your document? Yes, I am a medical student send to attending, and then the attending will put, I saw the patient, because you have to see the patient, and then you can put your comments. And this is an example of what the attestation is going to say. I saw and evaluated the patient. I personally obtained the key and critical portions of the history and physical exam, or was physically present for key and critical portions performed by the student, and discussed the patient with the med student. I agree with the med student's medical decision making as documented in the note. Okay? Um, before I get there, I will say that um, 
Our most recent uh, clerkship director's internal medicine survey data just came back. I was discussing it on a conference call last week, and they were reporting a third of hospitals are already using this, a third of hospitals are working on it, and a third haven't figured out even to get that far. So we should be in the third that have it in our institution. Absolutely. And this is uh, thanks to Dr. Armitage. She doesn't even know, but he, uh, this is on the program director's blog. And this is a physician at GW. You can see, and I thought this was a great comment on how well it works at their institution. The med students love it because their notes finally get read. The interns love it because once they coach the students how to do it well, it's one less note they have to write. So for us, it was a no-brainer once our compliance folks approved our tagline. And our compliance folks and computer folks have approved it, so we're on, on the road. Okay. So now I want to talk about a little bit about... There you got it, 74. <laughs> there, there was my question. Huh? And that was, uh, that was seven evaluations I'm just showing you. And that was one. Okay, how many interactions do you need with a medical student before submitting a CAS evaluation? One. And then how many evaluations, what's the minimal number of CAS evaluations the student is expected to obtain during his or her clerkship? That would be seven. And like I said, a threshold shelf exam score to obtain a clerkship grade of honor is 74. Okay? So I want you to know that. Okay. So I want to talk next about feedback on medical student notes, and uh, I would love to, in the end, try to kind of standardize how we think about notes, but I'm going to give you this framework for feedback, because I think it would help us if we're all thinking about it the same way. This is the RHYME framework. It was developed by Dr. Lou Pangaro. Dr. Lou Pangaro is an internist and medical educator at the Uniformed Services uh, um, Health Center in Washington, and he came up with RHYME. Being RHYME stands for Reporter, Interpreter, Manager, and Educator. Um, it's not that you progress from one and master one and then go on to the other. You're doing all of them all of the time, okay? But I'm going to go through and just kind of go through them a little bit, and then we'll kind of use a student note, and we'll talk about how to use that. Here's a reporter, okay? A reporter is somebody who accurately and reliably gets information. They have to gather the information. They have to also present it to you clearly. You want to observe the student doing this because you don't know if they're doing it accurately or not unless you do, do direct observation or at the bedside. Um, it shouldn't just be like a television reporter just spitting back data. You want somebody to show that they're asking the right questions, that they're thinking about what the algorithms are. And students at the end of their third year clerkship should be a master reporter. Next is the interpreter, okay? The interpreter is identifying and prioritizing problems coming up with a differential diagnosis, okay? This is the interpreter, the one who interprets the data and tells you about it, makes it the case for. Next is the manager. The manager is the one who comes up with the diagnostic and therapeutic plans for each of the patient's central problems. They are the ones who are going to be teaching you about what's going on. And the AI should be the one who's, who is mastering, functioning as a manager during their AI. Right? The reporter is doing the third year, the AI is doing the manager. And last is the educator. The educator is the one who knows, comes up with research questions, um, scrutinizes the quality of evidence, and shares in educating the rest of the team. Please note that educators are third-year students, too. I tell my third-year students I want them to be presenting to the team and teaching the team at least twice a week, little pearls, not 20-minute PowerPoints. You don't have time for that, but little pearls. They should be educators as well. As I said, it's not that you progress from one and, and master and then go on to the other. You're doing these all the time. Uh, what they noticed that was missing when they first came up with RHYME was professionalism. So they subsequently came up with PRIME because that's a really important part of the framework and something that really is critical. Okay. And the cool thing is, is here are those 13 core entrustable activities, and they map very nicely with the RHYME framework. Dr. Pangaro put this out in 2018. Here you see his number five for reporter, document a clinical encounter in the patient record. Gather a history and perform a physical exam. Provide an oral presentation. They map really nicely with RHYME masses with the 13 core entrustable um, professional activities. And they also did this nice chart, which I thought was kind of cool, where you could see the pre-clerkship students are over here. Here's the clerkship students. Here's the internship at the end of residency. And see here, the pre-clerkship students, they're just watching the doctors. 
Then they do it alongside them. Then you can see move up to teaching others, which is at the end of internship year when you're all going to be second years and you know teaching the interns and the medical students. You're at the top of that. Okay. Um, this is a real sample student note from an inpatient chart, one of my own patients, so I knew the medical student was taking care of this patient. Um, and I'm just going to go through it, and you'll see I'm going to, this is the student wrote this note, and we'll go through, and then we'll kind of apply the rhyme criteria. So Ms. T is a 76-year-old female with hypertension and hyperlipidemia, CKD5, and two separate primary lung cancers. She had a left lower lobe squamous cell and a right upper lobe adeno, who presented with moderate hemoptysis, most likely due to hip type 2 complicated by acute kidney injury requiring hemodialysis. Pretty complicated patient who was on the oncology team. Okay, this was a note my student wrote, okay, in the, in the electronic record. Here's her subjective data. Notice it's day number 40, okay. You know, and she tells what the patient is experiencing, okay, and here's the objective data, the vitals. And I showed you this page because here she talks about the physical exam. And here is what happens when you modify a note. When you modify a note, this is a legal record. It can never delete, okay? It will never delete. When you modify a note, a line gets put through it, and when, and like that, and here was the right thing that should have been said. It was cleared out to the patient, but the patient actually had no breath sound with the left face. At the end, when the note, when you're done modifying, what you only see, the crossed out part will disappear, and this will no longer be red. It will be black like everything else. But what is nice about that modification in the body of the note is the med student can go back and see what was changed, or you know the clerkship director, I can go back and see how notes were were changed and what the medical student first wrote. So that's nice. This was her assessment and plan, which I was overwhelmed with. So I knocked out the whole thing. I deleted the whole thing, and that's what it looks like. Okay, that's what it would look like if you deleted the whole thing. And then I kind of rewrote using her words, but I just put it into an organized format. I want to point out here, just because in the rhyme plan this is important, that she thought about the differential for um, HIT, you know, here that she was thinking about that when she said the 4T score was 5 with a confirmed anti hepin P4, F44 antibody. And here she's commenting, no she's the sites on the smear, not it wasn't TTP and DIC. Some of that was probably copy forward, but it's okay because she added to it. So um, in our computer assessment system, there are two types of feedback assessment forms that are sent to you. A formative and a summative. Formative is the interim one. Summative is the summary. Okay. Formative is is the cook's perspective. I need more salt. Summative is the customer's perspective. Right? What's it taste like at the end? Okay. So here, this is feedback using the rhyme criteria for that last note. It seems reporting of the patient's signs and symptoms were mostly accurate. Her physical exam had some errors and omissions. It would be helpful if her assessment and plan could be presented in a more organized format. Here's the interpretation, so that's reporting. Here's interpretation. She reported the lab data correctly and recognized the criteria for HIT type 2 and what else was in the differential diagnosis for thrombocytopenia. And here's management. She was anticipating discharge. She actually contacted me to explain the patient's complicated course and the need for close and thoughtful follow-up. She had good management and this communication skills goes back up in reporting, but it's really helpful if we all use the same language and think about it the same way. Um, I will tell you that you guys give great feedback. You got five to, to the residents. You give great feedback. And I know that it's hard to do more than one evaluation. But if we use the same framework for the evaluations that we're giving, that would be helpful. Okay. And I will also mention that CAS was originally, the way it was originally constructed was the thought was, why wait till the end of the rotation to give feedback to students? Why not give them little bits of feedback along the way? But I know how busy you are. I know you're in the moment. You're obviously doing wonderful teaching. But this was the, the reason behind kind of the way it was structured. And in order to give a grade to the student, they have to have two formative assessments from you. You can't give them a grade until they have two formative assessments. And the summative, this was actually one of the, a real summative assessment that was put in by a resident. But she was a truly outstanding medical student to have on service. Her attention to detail, ability to synthesize interview information, and case presentation skills were the most impressive I've seen with a third year student. She's chart review and clinical documentation is at the level of interest, way exceeding expectations. So she is a master reporter. That's what I take away from that. She's a master reporter, and she's progressing with interpretation. There's not a comment about her management skills or education or professionalism, but um, she did really well in that part. 
This is the summative evaluation that gets sent to you once you have two formative evaluations. We, um, it's pretty long, I'm going to show you. We couldn't even fit it onto one page. It's that long. So I do tell the residents when they start in the summer, and I always tell them, do not feel like you have to fill out 12 boxes. You can fill out one box. As clerkship director, I'll move things where they need to be. I'll put them in the right spot. Just fill one box. Don't feel like you have to fill out 12 different boxes. Notice here are the grades. Outstanding, above expectations, meets expectations, significant room for improvement. We have great medical students here at Case, and they all are hoping that when we fill out these evaluations that they're all going to get perfect scores. And a lot of them are really strong. And it's very hard to figure out what to give them. We, I told you we need seven evaluations. What we do is we sum up all those evaluations and we give a mean, and that's how we decide their score. For outstanding, they get 10. For above expectations, they get 8. For meets expectations, they get 6. Okay. Uh, I was going to do this, but I don't think I'm going to do that. Because I was going to say, how would you grade that student? And uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. We should, maybe we should do it and see how we come out as a group. Huh? Let's do it. Okay, come on. How would you grade that student? Okay. I'm going to leave it at that, but it's interesting. Okay. Um, so this student um, actually was one of our, I'm just going to share. As I said, we have great students here at Case. And this was one of our top students uh, who came through in the year last year. She was amazing. She was an amazing uh, student and, and did really well. Um, so part of what I'd like to do, actually, and I want to continue this, this is, is to think about how do you grade a student and how do we come up with a consistent grade and how are we all on the same page. That is really, really hard. For the students, we try to give them these competency anchors, which, you know, I kind of feel um, are, are challenging. Because to say you consistently and efficiently elicit histories and important positives and negatives, satisfactory, you have some gaps. You notice the honors, commendable, and satisfactory don't even quite line up with outstanding above expectations and meets expectations. That's my problem. Um, this is a, I just want to talk about a study that Dr. Jeremy Lipman did. He is, was the clinical director at Metro and is now the program director at the Clinic for Surgery. And he looked at um, characteristics to try, he sent out surveys to other clerkship directors and program directors and asked them to identify characteristics that help to define an honors student. And then they refined the list and they refined the list and they refined the list until so they came up with 10 common characteristics identified to merit an honors score. And if you look at these skills, it's, not, it's so hard to come down with a very clear what you're talking about and what issue you're talking about. Communication skills, good communication skills, good shelf exam scores, good synthetic ability, organizing data into meaningful care plans, an absence of professionalism issues, outstanding work ethic, taking advantage of learning opportunities, accurate and complete histories and physicals, enthusiasm, becoming an essential member of the care team, an outstanding clinical acumen. It's, it, this is a hard job. It's hard to grade somebody. It's hard to give them a grade. And also it's hard to think about um, the student in the context. I really hope that all of my students, my goal is not that they all get honors. My goal is that they're all competent and have achieved a great ability to do a history, physical, and clinical reasoning and be ready to go into their AIs. That's my goal for the clerkship. But we have to do grades because it's part of what we have to do. So I don't have a perfect answer for that. I'll tell you I'm working on it. So I would just kind of want to summarize. I zipped through this, but it's okay. I'll give you back some time. Uh, Core 1 Internal Medicine at UHVA is an important educational experience for students, and it's highly rated. Um, our electronic medical record note student attestation is coming, so be aware of that. Uh, CAS feedback, um, check your own, and don't forget to give it to the students. And think of PRIME, the framework, when you're grading more students. And so uh, thanks for teaching our students. This picture here is some of my medical students. I'm just going to make one last plug. That's at the Ohio American College of Physicians Regional Conference. That was two years ago. But the last five or six years, we've had the most abstracts accepted at the um, conference for the clinical vignettes they do. So I encourage your students to submit them and do poster presentations. Okay? And thanks again for teaching our students. Yeah. Um, really lucky to have you. So thanks for the fantastic As are our patients and our 
Yeah. Actually, no, we won't have less students. You know, it's one thing, um, it's an interesting question, you know, because the push for longitudinal ambulatory exposure is a national push. But our superior teaching, I don't want to compromise that to put the students in a mediocre outpatient experience when we have such a strong inpatient experience. And I think we have to champion that as that's what we're the best at and the students are going to recognize it. And I, my students are out there. And I think that that's something we have to say, we're really good at this. This is what we're really strong at and we're really good at that. Um, I think it's, personally, I think it's, it's um, I think the students benefit from being exposed to all four hospitals. We are amazing in Cleveland. We have, you know, an inner city hospital. We have a VA hospital, a socialized, socialized medicine that you get at the VA. We are, we're very academic. The clinic's pretty private. I think it's really unique that they can experience that. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of you, you showed grades. You know, a lot of, as a residency director, a lot of medical schools are getting away from grades. So our medical school doesn't give grades the first year. I think the first time this year, last year, our medical school doesn't stratify patients in the MSPE. Their patients doesn't stratify <laughs> MSPE. But, but um, clerkships are one, are one point in medical school education where students do get stratified. And I think you know when people apply for residency, that stratification probably is valuable for residency. <coughs> But you know, philosophically, do you think that stratification has any inhibition of learning? Because people worry about getting grades. I, I I think you know you hear it from different people. I mean, I, Dr. Preston's out there. He used to be the clerkship director of neurology. But I definitely think that you have to. You hear stories about students going and sitting, and my students are out there. But I this year I just changed it. We used to have one weekend where they came in for the whole weekend with the team. I now make sure they have one weekend day off because we can't ask them to study and then not give them time to study. That's not fair. That's giving them this mixed message. I know how hard it is when I have to do my evaluations at nighttime or my patient notes at night. You know, it feels, it feels bad to do that. I want you to be able to study and do real studying. So um, I do think that's an issue. You know, I, I think yeah. it's an issue. I mean, it's, the clerkship's really a, the only place where students really get ranked or stratified anymore um, in most medical schools. I'm really excited about the student note thing because I have to tell you, I think it's only going to make it better for students on the floors and interacting with patients. We had our feedback session yesterday because the six weeks of inpatient ended, and I won't name the student, but it was mentioned to me that part of the neglect she felt was because she wasn't writing the note. She, whether she had to go and talk to people separately than being in the main discussion because she had written the note. And I think that's really going to help the situation. I'm really excited for that because that's why I know I love medicine. Dr. Weiss has been a big advocate for students writing notes and a champion of this. And when the, uh, the CMMS rule came out, I guess, March of 18th. I'm so excited. I thought it would happen immediately. But, you know, it's like you know, compliance and legal and billing, but I think we finally come to the conclusion. You just have to convince them all, yes, this is the law now. Yeah, uh-huh, Dave. Hey, not that I agree with this, but wasn't there a move afoot nationally? We actually, we have a list of, you know, our core clinical conditions that the students have to go through. And I give them a list, plus I give them a graph. And they have to log, you know, for the medical school, they have to log those patients. You know, if they don't see the patients, they have, we have lectures, we have simulated cases, we have our um, aquifer, we have 49 simulated cases there. And actually, I've indexed them so that if they don't see a patient, I tell them either you can go see a patient you haven't seen, or if you happen to love Crohn's disease, do all the Crohn's disease patients. You know, either way, you can use Aquifer for that. And so that's available to them as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, so just to the question of CMS guidelines, so we're talking about a 19 intern and we're talking about 30 medical school notes. Both of them now are considered billable notes. Yep. You still have to see the patient sure. or see it with them. You still have to do the medical decision meeting, yeah. But the notes, so basically, and so an intern does an HMP and a student, well, the student can do the H. I'm encouraging my students to get pre-round, get their notes in early, so the intern can use their note. They have to read the note, they have to edit it, and then they can send it to you. Yeah, so can, I mean, you can just write it green above, you know? Yeah, so just trying to reduce redundancy of... Absolutely, it works. So more teaching time, better teaching. Yeah. I mean, what's the just doing? I mean, it's CMS guidelines. You can do it right now. If you, no, I mean, it's CMS guidelines. It is. It is. Yeah. 
this has been on the residency director's list, right. and I've been forwarding this to Debbie, and I mean, as she said, some places their their compliance people are saying you can't do it, and some places embraced it entirely you know, right. months ago. So it's I think the issue was because I had read that there was in one part which said that you have to be physically present. You know what? Did you see that last slide I put in from the Medical Learning Network with the revision in May? I don't think anybody knows because they appealed to them to say you don't have to be physically present. It says that on that. I think you have to yeah. verify the yeah, key portions. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm actually, I prom the um, people in, um, in uh, the IT people asked me to do a webinar, so I will do a webinar that I'm going to send out. But I can send this, yeah, I will. Yeah, so we can make that for Sure, 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 sure. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. No, you should not do that. You should not. That's yeah. I mean, it's amazing that we will ask that the scribes can. You can sign a note by a scribe who has not had medical education, but the medical students who've had much more training, you can't use their notes because of this 2000 because of the path audit, because of our tax dollars. <laughs> so. <laughs> So the yeah. path audit was, again, a lot of, of surgical things right. for billing for surgical procedures done by residents, you know, bedside procedures done by residents without being there. So the path, that's what I didn't want to blame the surgeon. <laughs> but, so that's why, the, again, the same language is that you have to sort of verify the key findings in there. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but the issue is nowadays uh, a typical note might be eight to twenty pages. I know. Literally, I know. I had to call that very much for that note. Yeah. Atrophy or fatty degeneration. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's, it's crazy to have an attending review hundreds of pages of notes each and every day. So how do we change? The I totally agree with you, and I'm working on it. Well, there's, there's, the, the term is note bloat. Yeah. And note bloat means when you bring things in. You bring in labs, you bring in x-rays, that this, it's available in other parts of the record. So there's really no reason to bring all that stuff in that best created 20-page note. What really matters in the note is is the history portion, the exam portion, and the assessment. And, you know, I, I wish notes were designed so you could find that easily and quickly, because that really that's what... You know, I, I've seen the I've seen the three-page MRI report already. I don't need it in the, in the students or residents' note. You know, I want to know what they're thinking. And I think note load. I guess we have to be this one. I think I guess people feel compelled to just bring anything, bring everything in. This is, as you know, when you print an electronic medical record, it's you know, it, it, it leads to deforestation. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Pat. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Thanks, yeah. yeah. So in terms of the notes, there's a lot of focus on that. Um, right now, the annotation language isn't there. Right. So if we want to use your notes, as Nate said, maybe come up with our own dot phrase. From yep, the slide. I will send it over. Yeah. 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 Um, so. mm -hmm. um, yeah it, I just say one more thing about Dr. Weisman. I think she was a real pioneer in having um, lots of things we're forgetting, mm -hmm. having students do night work, like mm -hmm. one of the first in the country, and it's been great for our students. It's been four nights, and uh, you know, work with interns, residents, and I work with, with the chief residents, and among other things. Oh, so that's right. We have a new uh, new night float uh, curriculum that the chief residents are, are putting yeah, out there, which is great to have an attending. You know, that one neglect that happened on night float, because we don't really have our attendings there. So we have the new night float didactics that are happening. Thanks, guys. Yeah. And I want to thank you for a fantastic grant and for everything you do. So